Good morning. It is us again. We're back after last week having a slight rest. Yes. A um, bit of a break. Because you worked we had, hard though. We had a day of fellowship. Mm -hmm. I think it went down well. I, um, I've spoken to a few people and they you know, seem to have liked it. So we're glad for that. Yes. And now we're back and we're able to bring you some of what we do here in our home again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were excited about what we're going to do today. We couldn't wait. And so welcome. Welcome to our place. Uh, today, Sidrin has, uh, sorry, the professor <laughs> has a bucket of water and um, some other things standing around here on the table. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited to be able to see what's going to happen. I think what we're going to do is um, I'm going to do a prayer. Then we're going to ask Riley to do our scripture reading. Mm -hmm. And um, then we're coming back to you and you will do your thing. Not a problem. And when you're done, then I will do my 20 minute thing. And that's it for today. Well, let's get on with it. Okay, shall we have a prayer? Dear, dear Lord, we thank you that we can be again uh, together today, even though we're so far apart. And as we spend this time together, we pray that you'll bless everybody involved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, so, uh, Riley is going to read our scripture reading. It's just one verse, and it's a verse that we find there in the story where Jesus walks on the water, and, uh, and then he says something that relates to our story today. So thank you, Riley. Happy Sabbath. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from... Matthew 14, verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Thank you very much, Riley. Well, it's good to be back. Today I wanted to share something about water. This week we've had such glorious weather here in Scotland and then it changed and it became quite damp and rainy but when we had this lovely warm weather we, it was so tempting to have the sprinkler on and really get ourselves wet what was missing was a swimming pool back in South Africa oh it was so nice on a very hot day if you could go and jump into the swimming pool oh, there was such a good feeling. One of the games we used to try and play as children was who could walk on water. Now I don't know if you guys had tried this but you take a run up to the swimming pool and you try and walk as fast as you can but evidently can humans walk on water? No. We just sink immediately. The closest we can come to walking on water is maybe using water skis. Now, I've never tried that before, but I've certainly seen some friends do it. But you have to go at some speed in order to glide over the water. So what's that got to do with our story today? Well, in the Bible, Jesus' disciple Peter, they were out in their boat and they saw Jesus come in and so Peter shouted out to Jesus Lord can I come to you and Jesus said come and so Peter got out of the boat and he started walking on the water and he had to have his eyes fixed on Jesus and the moment he took his eyes off Jesus he began to sink we'll come back to that story in just a moment so I thought, well, let's have an experiment. We've got some paper clips here, which I'm sure you'll have at home too. Now, a paper clip is made of metal. Now, can metal float? Surely not, but you never know, it's quite light. So should we have a look? If we put our paper clip in the water, no, nope, it sinks. Maybe that was a dud. 
Let's try it one more time. Let's try a different one. And I'm going to try carefully place it on the water. No, it just sinks. So how can we get a paper clip to walk on water? Well, in fact, you need a little bit of a support mechanism. So if you take one of your paper clips and you see the inside fold, if you bend it upright to a right angle like that, you have a support mechanism. So we're going to hold it by the long side and then we're going to take our other paper clip and we're going to balance it on top. Oop. <laughs> Try another one. There you go. Oh, is it going to balance? Going to balance it on there. And now we're going to just gently, I'm going to try to change hands so I don't knock the microphone. Oh, there it goes. We'll try it the long way around and see if that helps. Just very gently put it into the water. And take your paper clip off. It's floating on water. Now you may think, nah, really? Let's try it again. So we balance one on top and just very gently pop it into the water. That one just dumped down. So let me try a different hand. There we go. And our paper clips are walking on the water. They're floating. But now, just like when we come to Peter, he took his eyes off Jesus. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, he doubted. Those doubts come in and things start to go wrong. And so our dishwashing liquid is our doubts and our fears. And what happens when we sprinkle or oh, it starts to walk oh and as soon as it touches our paper clips they sink oh now just like peter did he took his eyes off jesus and he sank but when jesus reached down and grabbed him he pulled him back up and he was able to walk on the water with jesus back to the boat so i like you to think of this little paper clip as a support mechanism. This is Jesus. And when we have faith, we can cling to Jesus. He's our support mechanism. And just like that, when we have Jesus supporting us, then we will be able to, oh, that one's gonna sink. Not gonna work again. Yep. Not with the soap in the water. Not with the soap in the water, that's right. The, the molecular compound of the water has now changed because of the so soapy water. And so it's not gonna float anymore. But I'd like you to try that at home and see for yourself. Now in the Bible, it also Jesus made mention to a mustard seed. Have you ever seen how small is a mustard seed? I'm going to hold this up to the camera and hopefully you'll be able to see it. It is so tiny. And yet, Jesus says, if you have faith 
as small as a mustard seed, you'll be able to move a mountain. And the only time we can have so much faith is when we believe in Jesus and he is our support mechanism. And so I'd like to leave that with you today. And as you listen to Pastor Jimmy, as to how he explains a little bit more about the story about Peter and Jesus and how important it is to have faith, even when it is as small as a mustard seed, what great things can happen. So enjoy and I'll see you next time. Bye. And so we say thank you um, for Sadrine, for Professor Noodlebrain showing us how we can uh, make stuff float on water that we never thought would. Um, and it reminds us how impossible things could actually be positive, uh, possible. And so thank you for showing us this uh, wonderful experiment. Um, thank you for the reading of the text and uh, now it's just time for me to quickly share with you a few things. Now during this lockdown it has been interesting for us when we wanted to take a break some time out. We feel that we are very blessed and that we have some space around the house and we have a very nice little forest here behind our house. We have two cameras with long lenses and we like to keep an eye on the different birds in the vicinity. So we have discovered that we have a swarm of starlings who come to visit our place every day. And since we have seen some starlings for some time already, we've decided to do a bit of research on them. So we've noticed that there are some parents with their children who usually fly together and eat together. We soon found out that the children, uh, they look different from their parents. And the parents like to feed the children when they are sitting here on the grass. Our lawn provides plenty of worms for them um, to eat every day. But the other day, Sidri and I decided to buy a little bird bath for all the different birds who come to visit our backyard. Now we wanted to see birds starting to use this bird bath. It has two levels, one for water and one for some food. But for a whole day after we installed it, no birds were seen near it. We started wondering if maybe there was something wrong with this bird bath. It is a very colorful bird bath and we wondered whether they would be put off by the bright colors. And a day later I was sitting inside here um, and then from time to time looking out to see if there was any activity near the bird bath. And then a whole swarm of starlings came and populated the lawn. So I was naturally interested and I grabbed my camera sitting here by the table ready, looking through the window. Perhaps I could find a few nice pictures of the starlings up close. They all walked around the grass and kept their distance from the bird bath. There was plenty of food on the lower level, but no birds had gone there before. Then I suddenly saw something happened. One of the juveniles got on top of the lower level. He sat there and screamed. Remember, they, the juveniles don't eat by themselves. They wait for their parents to come and feed them. So the next thing, one of the parents hopped onto the lower level and there they discovered the worms that we have put out for them on that level. The parents started to feed the child and, and I was so excited. But then something happened. This made me even more excited. Some more birds started coming up to that first level and soon there were at least three or four parents and another three or four juveniles fighting for space on this first level. Wings flapping and mouths opened. Parents were putting dry worms inside the mouths of their little children. And this is interesting because I think that the birds generally are concerned with safety. I think they avoid going into certain places because they might know that there is danger or they might know, you know, there's something that shouldn't be there. 
So they don't know the bird path. They've never seen it before, at least on our lawn. And they know our lawn well um, because we see them every day. So they try to stay away from this new contraption. But it took one of the juveniles, one of the children, to take the leap and, and then discovering this plenty of food. It sometimes takes the faith of a child to start something big. As parents and adults, we are sometimes our own worst enemy. Many of us have been hurt too much. Many of us have seen too much failure. Perhaps some of us who are adults sometimes too afraid to start something because we fear that we might not be able to finish it. Sometimes for a child, when they don't know these kind of fears, they simply go ahead and do it. They simply leap into it and enjoy the ride. I know an adult who did exactly the same. He wanted to enjoy the ride, but then the fear in him took over and what in my view uh, would have been one of the best experiences ever almost ended his life because of the fear that sat within him. It became bigger than the faith that remained in him. Can I tell you that story? It is a story you probably know well. I am going to share with you the story as it comes from the book of Matthew. Go there with me in the book of Matthew and it is chapter 14 and it starts in verse 22. So Matthew 14 in verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, the key word of what we are discussing today here is the word faith. What is faith and why is it so important? As we have seen earlier with Professor Noodlebrain, a little faith will take us a long way. We don't even need much of it. So why don't we get things right? Perhaps it's not so much the quantity of faith that we need to consider, but perhaps it's a type of faith, the quality of it, that makes all the difference. Once again, remember the, the, the juvenile birds, they have no fear because they've not seen any danger. So they just go and explore places where their parents would not even consider going. Could it be that we live in a world that has become so dangerous that in order for us to achieve anything, we have to constantly measure up how safe it will be to do so? We live in a world where it has become more important for us to ignore social distancing rules in order to protest the injustices that occur and for which we cannot stand anymore. We live in a world where we forget our own health and safety in order to stand side by side with others so that we can protest the injustice that humans perpetrated against other humans. I think that although so many things are going on in this world, 
It is not that the world is so dangerous, but perhaps it is that our perceptions of things have changed a lot lately. I think that the correct approach to faith would make a big difference in the way that we perceive the world. And when I talk about faith here, I mean faith in God. You see, it is God who will make all the difference. And it is God who is in the business of making a difference. But when we don't see it because we don't look for Him, we are not aware of His great acts of miracles. And so when I use the word faith here, I'm really talking about a process of a relationship with the Creator of the universe that transcends every fear that we could have. You see, the story of the disciples in the boat gives us that edge. Already it says they were afraid. Now, when you are afraid, you tend to see the world in a way that it is not necessarily the way it meant to be. I remember failing a test when I was 15 years old and sitting closest to the teacher's desk and to the door, I received my test first. And when I received it, the teacher sent me out the door already. Why out the door? Because that's where you wait for the teacher to come out and take you into a little room where you get two of the best for failing the test. So as I'm standing outside the door, knowing I didn't study for this test at all, I thought I was going to be probably the only person in the class that day who is going to get two of the best. The next moment, two, three, four other guys also came out the door and for some reason I sighed a sigh of relief. Why? I was still going to get two of the best, but I wasn't getting it alone. And somehow that changed my view of the world around me. Fear is something that changes the way we look at the world. So we have a bunch of disciples in a boat on the rough sea. They've been out on the sea for a whole night. They're not unfamiliar with it. Some of them have been professional fishermen. They grew up around the water. So there they are on the boat early in the morning before it got light. And it is not the sea so much that gives them the scare. They see what they think is someone walking on water. Now, I don't know about you, but if it's dark and you see something that should not be, then something inside of us tells us to fight or flight. I guess that is what happened with the disciples. They saw something that did not make sense. Now, you may have known Jesus for a long time, and I know some of you do. But if something suddenly happens that doesn't make any sense, your ability to get into the fight or flight mode is wired in and will happen. The disciples shout immediately, it is a ghost. Now, I have no proof that any of them have ever seen ghosts before, so we have no knowledge of knowing that they knew exactly what they were talking about. But if, uh, if you were in a dark place at night and you see something, someone may be walking on water, I have very little doubt that we will all come to more or less the same conclusion. Now, that is the one part of the story. The part that really matters for us today is the part where they want to test whether this is really Jesus. And it is Peter, the one who always speaks before he thinks. If it is you, Jesus, command me to come out of the boat onto the water to you. Now this is where I think I would have loved to be there. I would have so loved to be the one who could walk on the water. I think the, mo the moment uh, that Peter's feet touched the water, he must have been overexcited. I can just imagine Jesus standing probably 10 yards away from him, hands stretched out in front of him saying, come on Peter, it's not far, you, you can make it, just keep coming. Now I have to say at this point, even if Jesus was standing right in front of me and I knew him all of my life, and I've never been able to walk on water, 
the natural instinct for me would be that I needed to look down. Jesus probably said to Peter, look at me and keep walking. And, and probably Peter did just that. He looked at Jesus and started walking. And just as he was uh, near Jesus, that natural instinct kicked in when he felt the waves. And he started looking down and thinking that he could sink at any point. And then he did. Now all of this is good and well, but it is what Jesus says next that gives us a bit of context about what is really going on here. Your faith has let you down. Not your natural instincts, but your faith. You ask me, what is faith? Faith has been defined in so many ways. In the NIV translation, for instance, faith is used 270 times um, and, and derivative of it 83 times. Faithfulness, 59 times. A major passage in the Bible and the meanings of faith we find in the book of Hebrews what it really means. Hebrews tells us what faith is in so many words. And we have so many commentaries in the world that we live in. Just taken from the story that we read, faith happens when we transcend our natural instincts. Faith is something that we do to allow us to go where we are not comfortable. Faith makes us vulnerable. If I could explain faith in a simple way, think of the chair you are sitting on. Before you sat on it today, did you come and examine it to see whether it will be strong enough to hold you up? Of course not. You know it will hold you up. You've been sitting on it for years. But that is exactly it. You are comfortable sitting on your chair because you know it will hold you up. None of us are comfortable walking on water because we know it won't hold us up. When we do things that we know work, that is simply us doing things. Faith is required when we need to do things that we don't know that it will work. And it is clear when we look through the Bible through those many times that we find the word faith. That faith was required at, required at times when people knew that they were not able to carry out whatever was in front of them because they simply have not done it before. So for instance, we have a beautiful verse in James chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea blown and tossed in the wind according to this to believe do faith is the opposite of doubt it is almost like we have to start believing that we can do something even if all our instincts tell us that we were unable to do it an interesting verse is one that i love reading and it's found in matthew chapter 6 it's verse 30 if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not more, much more clothe you, you of little faith? It tells us that we sometimes think of think life will end for us, and when we sometimes think that it happens because we have a lack of faith. And we don't need much faith. We just need a little faith, a little bit of faith. Sometimes we think that we need somehow to put together a large amount in order to achieve something. But that's not biblical. I believe that thinking we need a large amount of faith is counterproductive. Remember this simple story that we found in, in Matthew chapter 21. In verse 18 it says, Early in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? they asked. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, 
Go, throw yourself in the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for. Now, I have never moved mountains in my life. But that's not because I have weak faith. It's because moving mountains is not really what God wants us to do with our faith in a physical sense. He wants us to move mountains more in a spiritual sense. Faith is a small mustard faith like a small mustard seed. In Matthew 17, we read, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive out the demon? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If we have faith as small as a mustard seed, then nothing should be impossible for us. I know you're probably saying, well, as soon as this is over, I'm going to go to the ATM and I have faith that uh, I'm going to, it's going to be as, at least the size of a mustard seed. I'm going to pray that the ATM will, will, will tell me that my bank balance is now 10,000. But that's not the point. God says to have faith in Him. Faith in the fact that He can move mountains. Faith in the fact that He can change our lives. Because that is what He does. Remember, we are human. He is supernatural. And He has the ability to do anything anyone could ever imagine. I want for you to have such faith. Faith that God will also intervene in your life as He did in mine. When I was five years old, I believed that all mummies smoked cigarettes with yellow ends on them and all daddies smoked cigarettes with no yellow end on, him, on it. That was what I believed. And when I saw a man smoking a, a cigarette with a yellow thing on it, I thought he was a sissy. You see, my parents both smoked and that's what they smoked. My mum had cigarettes with yellow ends on it and my dad had cigarettes without any yellow on them. So I just believe that this is how the world works. And growing up, I always believed stuff like this. Beliefs like this will fill our minds and it happens to everybody. Sometimes you grow up believing that certain things can be done and certain other things cannot be done. So I grew up in a home with, where nobody believed anybody could have a degree after school. I grew up in a house where the word university did not exist. In fact, I grew up in a family where that was the case. No one in my family had a degree. I grew up in a community where that was the case. I still even believed that after school, that I was not going to be able to get a degree. It was until five years after school that I started thinking it was possible for me to get a degree. And then I started changing my outlook on life. I started believing in myself. I started to change what I had, the, f the faith in myself. And then I earned my first degree, paying for it all and not owing anybody anything afterward. Now I know I had some help during that first degree. And I know that certain individuals made contributions to my account. And I know some of them. But I certainly don't know the majority of those who contributed to my degree. Individuals contributed to my achievement. And, and that was not all of myself, but that's how faith works. God puts on our path individuals who will make a difference, who will help you achieve that which you cannot do by yourself. Now that I have three degrees behind my name, I'm starting to think anything is possible. Just like the verse says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, anything can be possible. We don't have to have large amounts like we did with, um, like we've thought we should have, you know, to make something work. Only a small amount will make a difference, a small amount of faith. It really comes down to this, is that you realize that God is in your life. That you realize that we need our Creator and that He is keen to make our lives better. 
So we live in a world that is dangerous, a place where humans treat each other like they are less than human, and we want to respond to that by flocking together, ignoring distancing rules, because it is so important for us to fix what is wrong with the human race. We are willing to put our lives on the line because we want to better ourselves as humans. I believe it starts right at home, where each of us should take a small step of faith. Each of us, when we take a small step of faith, will realize that God needs us to be humble. And then we can change the world. So for your own sake and for the sake of those around you, I want to challenge you today to test your own faith. Are you connected with God? If not, what is preventing it? I want to leave this challenge with you. Have faith. God will change everything. God bless. Now, uh, we are going to be singing a song that was prepared for us by Gordon. And we say thank you very much, Gordon, for once again leading us in our final song. And uh, I will say the benediction when that is finished. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you again next week. Same time, same place. We are back and we are doing it um, as we've done before. We are behind the Day of Fellowship and we're looking forward already to seeing you next week again. Thank you very much for being with us today. Please pray with me as we, as we say the benediction. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you walked on the water. An amazing story like that enriches even our lives 2,000 years later. It helps us to realize what it means to have faith. I pray, dear Lord, that you will be with us during this week to come until we see each other again, that we may exercise our faith. Amen.